Psalm 57 is where we're at, right? Smack dab in the middle of your Bible. If you just laid it open, you're, you would end up right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 57. In the three Psalms that we're gonna look at tonight, these are written by David. And what is interesting, and we're gonna see a little bit of a pattern tonight, is so often, you know, we see in the, the Psalms that, that the first half of the Psalm, David will, you know, start with this plea. You know, and, and it looks dark and it looks bleak and he's crying out for God. And then the second half, there's something that happens and, and, and then he begins to trust and then he's proclaiming that God is good. And this is what we see here in Psalm 57, where he says, Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions. I, I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and their arrows and their tongues are sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. Here comes the turn. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your loving kindness is great to the heavens. And your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. So this pattern we see here, where David starts off and it's, it's bleak, right? He, he, he's talking in verse one, my soul takes refuge in you. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide away in the, in the wings of your refuge until, verse one, destruction passes by. I cry to the God, to my God. It's bleak. There's enemies. I mean, look at the description that he says in verse four, that even the sons of men whose teeth are like spears and arrows, their tongue, a sharp word. So obviously there, there's speech going out that is just difficult and disparaging. But then there's a change. And then he says, my heart is steadfast and, and I'm steadfast in you and, and awake, oh my glory. There's, there's almost this praise. It goes from pleading to praise. And so often when we look at these Psalms, it's, we're looking at, it's almost like we're, we're getting this glimpse of David's prayer life. It's like he's written out his, his prayer as he's praying to God. And so I want to ask you, what is it about prayer that changes our perspective? If we're looking at this example of David, who he goes to prayer and it's dark and it's difficult, but then he comes out and it's glorious and he's excited and he's praising God. So what is it about prayer that changes our perspective? You can either chat in online if you're online here or just let me raise your hand and, and Andrew could give you the microphone. Oh, we got over here. You might need a second runner. You're running around. What is it about prayer that changes our perspective? It opens our hearts and our minds to the truth of what's in God's heart. Focus. Changes focus. Yeah. Up here. I had a pastor friend that always would say, um, instead of looking at how big our problem is, let's look at how big our God is. What else? What is it about prayer that changes our perspective? We got Matt up here in the front. Yeah, just toss it. Catch. <laughs> now just hand it off. Don't throw it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sorry. I mean, is it on? I don't know. Is it test? Should be on. Jenny, you got another one here? Okay. Hello? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I know for me too, also, it, uh, praying forces you to kind of slow down. Oh. So, like, if you are super anxious and you are having a super stressful moment, uh, whether it's work or life or whatever it is, if you slow down and actually pray, it actually forces like your whole body to like shift and change. Kind of like the same thing for like posture. Yeah. You're slouching and kind of hurt. You accept like, tight. Like, oh, it feels way better. So for me, it slows down. So online, Jordan Hill says, uh, "God will become God's will becomes our will, and slowly we become more like Him." It's like this changing that happens. I like that. It kind of we conform to him as opposed to ours. Jill says it changes our perspective by readjusting our thoughts with God's thoughts. Evan says prayer gives us the realization that God is actively listening to us. Do you want to expand on that, Evan? Where is he out in the foyer? <laughs> okay. Katie Freeze. Katie Freestat says, <laughs> what happened? what I miss? <laughs> Didn't those speakers in the bathroom work great? Yes. We got those newly installed. They're kind of nice. Anyways, um, <laughs> Katie Freestat says, when we pour out our heart and troubles on the Lord, it leaves room for him to fill and give us eternal perspective. Ooh, I like that. As we empty ourselves, then we're positioned to be filled. Anybody in the room uh, want to chime in any more on that idea? What, what is it about prayer that changes our perspective? I'll say something. Yeah. Uh, I think that when I do pray, which isn't enough, uh, it forces you to be honest with God. I think I can put on the face that I want to when I'm talking with other people. But um, my heart is sensitive to God, and I don't want to lie to him. And so it helps me to get the words out that are real. And uh, so then it just helps my heart and everything kind of focus on what's, what, how am I really feeling, and what should I be feeling. It exposes things. Yeah. I like that, too, because um, just to encourage you guys, God is not put off by whatever you're going to say. He already knows it. And so by you... Um, confessing that the word in the New Testament is homologeo. It's to speak the same. By, by confessing, you're, you're, you're speaking what God already knows, and you're agreeing with God in that, and, and it's a healing that can happen. Mike, you're going to say something? Yeah, he's our creator. He created us, and knows who's supposed to be in the Great. So I think we can agree as we're in this room. Oh, one more Don. Yeah, let's hear from Don. No. There have also been times when I've been praying and God's pointed me to be part of the solution. I do. That's a little different perspective also. You, you actually get like the Holy Spirit directing you. Yeah, like maybe you should be I've got something for you to do in this problem. That's, that's happened to me, to me more than once. Yes, I fully agree. Because the posture thing, you're, you're putting yourself in a position to be able to hear from the Lord rather than you just spitballing about what you're going to come up with. <laughs> you shut up for a second and listen. Prayer changes perspective. And, and so we, as we see that in the psalm here, um, I think this is something that we can take to the Lord and and. If you think about, um, boy, current world events and just trying to wrap your brain about what is going on, not only just here in the States, but in the world stage, and understanding that you just fall so short on understanding it, we can take that to the prayer. And something that David, you know, this particular experience, um, David, when he says here, in verse 1, until destruction passes by. One thing that we've seen in David's life becomes a huge part of the Psalms is this relationship that he has with his father-in-law, the King Saul, and this pursuit that Saul has 
that he, he goes mad and wants to kill David. And there's this representation of basically an enemy, a threat that he doesn't fully understand. And it's almost like an intimate threat, but it's a, it's a huge threat that comes upon him. And this particular psalm, it comes out of 1 Samuel 24. Turn over there. Turn left in your Bible there. Go over to 1 Samuel. We were here in our last study. We were in 1 Samuel 23. And if you guys remember that, if you were with us, that, that David had fled and he was in a different land. And it says in Psalm 23 that the Ziphites had sold them out, that they had told Saul where to find David. And David was hiding. And it says there that we read in 1 Samuel 23, verse 27, as Saul was about to apprehend David, a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. And when we unpack that, we're looking at this idea that God can provide in ways that don't always, you know, we wouldn't write that script or we wouldn't fully understand how God would provide deliverance for that. And we made note of that. But so there's short reprieve. And then 1 Samuel 24, Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, verse one. And he was told, behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And so... Saul doesn't waste any time. He grabs 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel, and he went to seek out David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. And so we have this imagery here of um, En Gedi, which is this beautiful little oasis uh, down near the Dead Sea in southern Israel. And there's all kinds of caves and, and various places that you can go. And if you're shepherding out in the desert, you're looking for water, you're looking for shade, you're looking for safe places for your animals. And so no doubt David would have been aware of these caves and he would have used these caves at times to get his flock in there and protect them. So he's aware of these things. So he's going to hide out in one of these caves. He came to the sheepfolds on the way and where there was a cave, verse three, and Saul went in to relieve himself. You guys know the story when David's hiding in with his men and Saul goes in to go to the bathroom. Sorry, I was going to make a joke, but anyways. <laughs> it's too relaxed on Wednesday nights. So anyways, uh, he goes to relieve himself. And now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So the scene is, he's hiding in the cave. Saul comes in to relieve himself. It's obviously dark. Saul goes from being in the bright sunlight. He goes into the cave. It's dark. You know how it goes when you go from light to darkness. Sometimes it's hard to see in the dark. It's Really, So he's going to go to the bathroom anyways. He doesn't realize that they're in there. David's guys say, this is the time, David. Take your revenge. And David rose and he cut off an edge of Saul's robe secretly. Verse 5, it came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. And so at the time, Saul was still the king. And David was living in a way that was honoring to the king. And so he felt convicted by this thing. And he said to this men, far be it from me, verse six, because of the Lord, I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him. And since he is the Lord's anointed, David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul rose and left the cave. And then there's this whole interaction there at the end of the chapter where basically Saul comes out with the robe and says, oh, king. And then the king's like, David, is that my son? And then you're a better man than me because you didn't take my life. And this whole interchange. Anyways, back to Psalm 57. So this experience comes out of this. And so he's waiting for destruction to pass him by. Imagine being in the cave, and here comes your enemy coming by. And he is waiting on the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. Interesting thing to me, he, he talks about in verse 6. So verse 4 and 5, there's sort of this idea of the slanderous tongue against him. And then 5, he... He's praying to God again. Verse 6, he recognizes that the enemy has prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me, but they themselves have fallen into it. 
So the idea that he was going to trap David, and yet Saul walks right into the trap himself. And so the Lord provides this thing that maybe David thinks he's stuck. I'm thinking about it in, in this context. David thinks he's stuck. He's fallen into the trap, and yet the enemy falls in the trap himself. And so all of a sudden, he realized that David is put in the, this position of being the better man, it says in those scriptures, and has this experience that, again, he wouldn't write that script. He wouldn't say, I'm going to hide in a cave. I'm going to have Saul walk by. He's going to go drop his drawers, go to the bathroom. I'm going to cut off a robe, piece of his robe. He's going to leave. I'm going to wave it in the air and make this. At the end of the book of Genesis, there's this interesting interchange between Joseph and his brothers. You guys know that Joseph's brothers, they took him, they stripped him, they threw him in a, in a, a pit, and we're going to sell him off. They sold him off into slavery. And then years go by, and Joseph ends up rising to the most powerful man in Egypt besides Pharaoh. And he becomes in this position to be able to provide for the land. The land goes into a famine. His brothers then come in. They don't know it's Joseph. And he's in this unique position to actually provide food for his family. And there's this awareness that his brothers, finally they're aware of like, oh my goodness, this is our brother that we were going to kill. We thought was dead. Now he's like the most powerful man in the land. What is he going to do to us? And then he says this bold statement in Genesis chapter 50, verse 2. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So the enemy sets out with evil intentions, and yet God has a way to turn that to good. I just wonder about this global conflict. And again, this is way above my understanding. But what I do understand is that, that this thing that, Dave, that, that Joseph says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so this thing is happening around us, even the, even the pandemic. Let's pick on that for a moment. We've talked a lot about that. The enemy might have made this thing for evil, and yet there was good that came out of it. That God had used this thing in, in some ways for good. And so I think as the enemy sets out to the evil intentions, God is greater and he can take tragedy, he can take difficulties, he can take setbacks, traps, he says there in verse 6, and God can turn them for good. And all I'm trying to do right now is just stir your thoughts in maybe a different perspective and as you're considering your life and the world events and things that happen around you that maybe God is working something for good there that that you don't quite see. But I think there needs to be an awareness, and I'm sort of, I know I'm a little bit all over here in this little passage. I do think there needs to be awareness, too, of the enemy. As we talked about on Sunday morning in 2 Timothy 3, where Paul set up, says, realize this, and last days, these difficult times will, you know, there'll be difficult times in these last days. Um, there is an enemy, and we need to be aware that there are traps set by the enemy. And this is why I want another little conversation starter here. What do you think the traps are in today's world that we live in? What, what is a trap that the enemy puts out? What, what, are the, what are the pits that the enemy digs? We've got another one over here that is waiting for you to come along by and, and fall into. What do you think? My grandfather, or no, my grandmother used to read the Bible to me when I was a young child. Um, and I recall her saying that the things that we were going to see when we aged that she was so fearful for us that there's gonna be so many changes in the world. I was gonna tie that into your question. Um, 
what it made me think of was she, she would say the times of the end. You mentioned that yourself. The things that I'm seeing and the things that my mother and grandmother told me when I was young seem to be coming about. Um, and I heard you say the times of the end. And you mentioned the wars that are going on. All the stuff that's going on in the world, like the global warming, you see the waters rising, you see the pollution. What, what scares me is that the things that my grandmother told me about what we were going to see, and I am actually seeing them now. And you just, you brought that to my mind, that's why I spoke about it. So maybe I can capitalize on that for a moment, because I think maybe in that instance in your mind, the enemy may lay a trap of fear for you. And, and I think that's a, that's a big one in this thing that we've gone through uh, together is, is a big pit of fear. And we've fallen into it um, or been, have been trapped by it. What else? What else is the enemy in? Well, along with that note, you know, our creator created us, created us, each one of us right now to handle what is taking place right now. The days that we live in, yeah. Yes. He's given us, he's given us his community. So let me capitalize on that and say the enemy would put doubt. Mm -hmm. The doubt would be a trap that, no, I, I don't have what it takes to live in this world. I, I don't know what to do with this. Right, but he has gone before us. He's a light unto our path. He is showing us the way. Mm -hmm. He is giving us the courage the, and the ability to live. Mm -hmm. Fearless. Good. What other traps? The enemy. We got one over here. Andrew in the back. Finn wants to say something. Finn? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say a lot of times I would think not so much what the enemy does is try to make you do something, but try to not make you do something. I would say like uh -huh. keeping you from prayer, keeping you from being in the word and and living by the word and not watering it down. So like, can we say distraction? Distraction, yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that's a huge pitfall for Christians. Like I'd say less than less so than sin, because sin you know, like there's forgiveness for it, you, there's redemption, all this stuff, but it's like we should be on the offense, like and that's I think really what the enemy doesn't want. Complacency. You know, you think I think um, if we were to pick on American Christian living, you know, we live in a, this prosperous, we got one right here, Andrew, we live in a prosperous nation. We have so many things be, right there. Oh. I was just going to say, in, um, speaking of world events and stuff, um, Manuel and I have actually lots and lots of family and friends in Europe. And we have a cousin and his very young family right now in Poland and they're doing a lot of work with the refugees. Yeah. And they've been giving us a lot of actually really uplifting reports, um, just how amazed they are at, even though it's right on their doorstep, the war, I mean, because they're in Poland and they're right on the border of everything. But they're just so, they've been so uplifted with the support of so many and the prayers of so many. They feel the love and the support, even though they know just right next door the devastation and what they've seen. They've seen the sadness in the mothers and the children. Well, then last night I got another message from Juan, and he told us that. Um, things have really made a change and that they're seeing a lot more children dying. Um, it's just really increased um, with a lot of pressure with the more refugees and stuff. It's really increased. And um, I was just going to say that, um, and he was talking about this, the greed uh -huh. that, you know, the way nations have changed, like we've had periods like this before, but it seems like a lot of, in a lot of ways, not all nations and not all people, but we tend to focus a lot on ourselves and our, and it's kind of like you said, the fear, you know, like how am I gonna take care of myself? Well, that would be from our Sunday morning scriptures that it said uh, in, the, in the end times, 
you know, people would be lovers of self. Yeah. And I think that would be a trap, uh, right? And it would be a, a pitfall that the enemy could lay for us that like, and how am I going to afford, you know, the gas? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. how am I going to be able to do this if we support anything? You know, it's almost like, okay. Of course, you know, there's two sides to this. Obviously, we don't necessarily want to get involved in a war either. So right. there's, there's, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be political here at all. That's not what I'm saying. But when he put it so beautifully, because they feel so much love and they feel people's support and they feel the prayers and they see the beauty of people helping and doing so much for these desperate people and the women and the babies and the children. But they just, last night, he just messaged me and said there was a drastic change yeah. in the situation. So it really needs to be something we pray for. Yeah. But then I've talked to my family in Sweden and Germany and Spain, and they're all, um, I haven't spoken to anybody yet from England or, um, um, Finland, but um, they're also just amazed that in this era, you know, where we have so much this, you know, high tech era in the year 2022, that this is actually happening. Yeah. You know, so it's just that whole greed and, you know, everybody's into themselves. And yeah, it's just very interesting. And it does make me think of end times for sure. <laughs> So online, uh, Katie says that putting our hope in anything other than Jesus is a trap. Eric Feinstein says that the internet can be a trap, as that it's very easy to spread misinformation. Yeah, the internet's a big uh, trap there. I think I just want to be aware that I, we just have an awareness that, you know, Peter talks about the, the devil going around like a roaring lion, and he's seeking to devour. And so... That one seems, sometimes we read that, we're thinking, okay, we're on the lookout for a, a roaring lion. When I see that, I'm going to just like avoid the roaring lion. But we don't always see the pit that's dug out with the camouflage over it. And there's things that creep in, there's things that sneak in. So just an awareness, I think this is what's important. So trusting yourself, trusting world systems, doubt, fear. Uh, so then he turns the corner here and We've already talked about this. He's brought his prayer before, and then he declares this steadfastness. And I think this is what we need in this time, especially as Julie was sharing. We need a steadfastness in our heart. My heart was just breaking this morning. I've been to uh, Russia. I was involved with a, there was a church plant there. Uh, I've been to Moscow, been to Novosibirsk, and other areas. We have, we've supported a church in Novosibirsk for years. Dear, sweet people, sweet Christian people that have want nothing to do with this. And yet we have everybody like on, you know, I mean, I, most everybody brings Putin, right? But there is this wedge. It's like Russia. And I'm thinking about these sweet Christian people that are in there that want nothing to do with this. I just broke my heart for that. And, and I think this is where we need the steadfastness in our heart. And it's a thing of faith that we're going to trust the Lord that he, he's going to work this thing out, and that he is in control. Um, Psalm 58. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? David turns his focus here to a corrupt judicial system. You can translate verse one when it says, oh gods, you can translate as judges. And then he talks about, do you judge uprightly? And you think about this idea of if you have the breakdown of a judicial system in a nation, the nation is going to break down. If there's corrupt judicial system, then it kind of flows down and people eventually get taken advantage of. And so he's calling this out and it's, it's a real prayer for God to intervene. And he says, do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? No, in heart you work unrighteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. They have venom like venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear so that it does not hear the voice of the charmers or a skillful caster of the spells. You, you almost get the sense that he's calling out these corrupt judges or this corrupt judicial system as, as though they are 
poisoned. And if you think about just in some of the New Testament scriptures that we have, Ephesians 6.12 talks about this battle that we have going on, and it's not just the flesh and the blood, the battle that's going on, but there's a spiritual warfare that's happening, and that the enemy could influence government and judicial systems. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, it's against powers, it's against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And there are dark, wicked forces at play that have influence over people. And so it's almost like David is recognizing this, that verse 4, they have venom like a venom of a serpent, like they've been poisoned. Or they're, as this serpent, you know, you, you, you get this Far Eastern sort of picture of this scorpion, you know, coming out of the, the thing with the guy that's doing the flute, do 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 you know, and the serpent's coming up. And it says it doesn't hear the charmer, it doesn't listen, it's just doing its own thing. He prays against them, a pretty serious, strong prayer against those who would be part of this corruption. Verse 6, he says, Oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrow, let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along, like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep away with the whirlwind, the green and burning alike. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, and men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. So David prays a strong prayer against this corruption. And what I like about this is he's praying for God to intervene. And I think this is the best, the highest and the best thing that we can do, first and foremost, is prayer. Pray that God would intervene. If we see injustice, if we see corruption, that God would intervene. And then it would be, God, do you want me to be a part of the solution to that? Ultimately, God is in control and he will intervene and he will make things right. It it says here, um, you know, Jesus is the one that shatters the teeth of the enemy. If we think about the, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, the thing that happened when Jesus went to the cross, you guys remember, that there was the, the temple veil in the temple, it, and there was this, basically this room in the temple, the Holy of Holies, where, the, where God's presence dwelt. And there was this barrier called the temple veil. It was a barrier between God and man. It was physical. It was a visible barrier. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it says that that barrier was torn from the top to bottom signaling that this was a work of God. And by Jesus' death, the burial, and the resurrection, Corinthians tells us that he conquered death. He stared death in the face and he conquered it. And so then it says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore be steadfast and movable, always bound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. Because of what Jesus did, he declawed the lion right? Death no longer had victory because he conquered death. And as we have faith in Jesus Christ, we then have eternal hope. And so there is this, verse 11, men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. And whoever would call upon the name of the Lord of Jesus does not perish, but has eternal life. And there is this hope of heaven, and that that Jesus will make things right. And it's tough right now. It just is. It's just like, how is this going to get right? But there will be a day where he makes things right. We are the righteous by faith in Jesus. That's right. That's the promise of the scriptures, that whoever should believe in the Lord. Call upon the name of Jesus. I intended to get to Psalm 59, but I think it's too much. So I'm going to leave that on the table for next week.
I guess there's a, a big overall theme as we've been talking about this stuff is it's really been pushing us, I think, to, to consider God is in control and that he has our interest, I, I guess not necessarily our interest, but he, he has a care and concern for us and he is with us. Romans says there's nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we have the promises of the Holy Spirit for the empowering of daily life and for guidance, promises of God's word. And so really, we can find rest in that and confidence in that, that God is in control and that he will have his way. And it doesn't always look like what we thought. And he could take what is meant for evil and he could make it good. And I'm encouraged by that because that gives me hope, thinking, all right, I don't get this. This seems wrong to me, but what is God going to do with this? What is God going to do with this? Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that this would, um, instead of choking us, would nourish us. (laughs) Lord, I pray that uh, in our minds and our hearts, Lord, as we commit to reading your word, that you would work these things out, God. And Lord, we could trust you and be excited about what you're doing. We can anticipate you making things right and that you protect the righteous and that you take care of the evildoers. Again, Lord, we lift up this conflict and we pray for your will to be done. And we ask, Lord, that this conflict would stop. And the world would see that you're in control. Bless us, Lord, I pray. Lord, help us against the the traps of the enemy. Lord, the pits that are dug, the nets that are laid. Lord, help us to see them for what they are and not allow them to distract us from our devotion to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.